All right, uh, again, thank you, DJ Drop, DJ Drop Table, for uh, keeping things fresh. All right, so uh, we, we have a lot to talk about. Um, real quickly, again, for the assignments, Project 3 has been put out, uh, and that'll be due on Sunday, November 17th. And I'll talk about that briefly at the end of this class. And then Project, or sorry, Homework 4, should be 4, not 3, 4 will be released next week, and that will be then, uh, that'll be due on, on the 13th, okay? And as I said, my wife is going, we're going to the hospital tonight. It's going to happen like nine hours from now. Uh, so I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I won't have office hours next week or the following week. And then next week we will still have classes. My PhD students will, uh, will be taking care of those classes. Then the following Monday will be again one more PhD student. And then we'll have no class on October 30th. And then the schedule correctly reflects this. Okay? So any questions about any of this? And then I would make arrangements with my, my admin about uh, having all the midterms in her office, and then we'll figure out some time you could go come to her office and check, check out your, uh, your midterm. Again, just bring your student ID so she, she knows who you are. Okay? And then if you, have, uh, if you want something regraded, take a photo. You can't take your midterm with you. Just take a photo of the page you want regraded and email me, and we'll, and we'll take care of it. Okay? All right, so... Where we're at now in the course is that we've covered the entire stack. We've covered how to store things on disk. We've covered how to uh, put things in our buffer pool, the access methods to do scans, how to execute operators, and how to do query planning. So now we're going to actually look, look at, for the next four weeks, we're going to go back and look at the entire architecture all over again, and now consider uh, two important components, concurrent control and recovery. And these concepts actually permeate all throughout the entire system. We kind of need to understand the basics first, and that's why we went through without discussing any of these things. And now we're going back and seeing how we, you know, if you want to enforce concurrent control or make sure that our database can be stored on disk safely, how do we make sure that, that you know, we, how do we modify what we've already talked about to account for these things and take care of it? So again, concurrent control and recovery are all, you know, they're not like sort of these separate things on the side, like the buffer pool manager or, or an index. The entire system needs to be aware of what, how it's going to be durable, how things are going to be, uh, how transactions are going to run safely, and so that's why we're again we're covering this at, at the uh, at, at the, the at the second half of the semester. And I would say also too, once we have these two things, that you can go off in the world and build your own database system. Like these these are the last two things we need to actually build a database system that can run transactions correctly and make sure that everything is safe. So we're almost there. So to motivate why we want to talk about concurrent control recovery, let's look at two simple scenarios. So let's say that I have an application where I want to have two threads try to update the same record in the same table at exactly the same time. How do we make, how do we make a decision about which one should succeed? What should be our final change? And there's a race condition here. All right, what if one comes slightly before, the, before, the, before another? The other scenario is that let's say that I have an application that, that, that for my bank, and I want to transfer $100 out of my account into your account. But let's say, you know, before I, you know, after I take the money out of my account, but, but before I can put it in your account, the, the building, the data center gets struck by lightning, the, 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 we lose all power, our machine crashes, our database system crashes. So when we come back, what should be the correct state of the database? Right? What, what should we actually see? So the first problem, uh, that I'm talking about here at the top, this is an example of a lost update. If I have two transactions, two th threads, try to make an update to the same record at the same time, I, I couldn't have, end up missing one. All right, how do I make sure that doesn't happen? And the way we're going to uh, ensure that th these things happen correctly is through a concurrent control mechanism, a concurrent control protocol. For the second scenario where my machine letter, my, 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 my data center catches on fire, and I, you know, my, I lose power and my machine crashes, we're going to use the recovery mechanisms in the database system to ensure durability. So these two concepts, concurrent control and durability, are one of the main selling points of a database management system. This is why if you're building an application, whether it's in the cloud or on a cell phone or on, on a desktop, you don't want to be in the business of doing these things yourself in your application because you're probably going to get it wrong. And you can end up losing data or have incorrect data. This is why you want to use a data management system because they can have they have really smart people that have been spending a lot of time to make sure that these things happen correctly. If you also think about it too, like if you're a startup, uh, you know the if you're shipping an application, 
it doesn't matter, you know, the, at the end of the day, what's, what, what's not gonna sell your product is, oh, I can, I can recover the database after a crash. Right? You need that as a feature you absolutely have to have, but that's not a differentiating uh, aspect of your application versus your competitors. Right? So you don't want again, if you don't want to be business of writing a database management system yourself unless that is your job. For everything else, people should rely on you know uh, high quality software, database system software that that is that is vetted to do these things. So the core concept that we're going to use for the next four weeks discussing this these you know running the, our system to make sure that things are running in the correct order or running uh, that all our changes are still durable is this idea of transactions that are, that, that are going to run with ACID guarantees or ACID properties. So there's a quick show of hands. Who here has heard of the acronym ACID before? All right, about half. Okay, so don't, we'll, we'll cover that. So before we can talk about ACID, let's talk about what a transaction is. So in our world today, all right, for, for what we're talking about in this lecture, a transaction is going to be the execution of a sequence of operations on a database system to perform some higher level function. And so these operations, you can sort of think of that as SQL queries or the reads and writes we're doing to the database. Um, and by higher level function, I mean something like that, that we want for our application, you know, some, some, some feature we want our application to perform or, or the steps. Like transfer money from my account into your account, that would be a high level function. Because right? that's something we would program in a transaction in our application. No database system is going to have that, that feature, that, like, that single function could call you know, move money. Like this is something you would write in your application up above. So transactions are going to be the basic unit of change in our database management system, meaning this is how all changes are going to occur in the, in the, in the wrapped inside of a transaction, right? Whether it's, if, if it's multiple queries or a single query, it's always going to be a transaction. I suppose you can have a zero query transaction, but that doesn't really mean anything, right? But it, it, it's assumed that it's, it's one or more operations that we want to do. And so the key concept, though, about transactions is that we're not going to allow for par partial transactions. Or transactions are always going to be atomic. What that means is that if I have a sequence of five updates I want to do, either all five occur or none of them occur. I can't have, you know, some, like, you know, maybe the first three out of the five succeed and the other two fail. Right? It's either all or nothing. And even if you have a single query transaction, a single operation transaction, say I have an update query that updates five tuples, Right? Still one query, but within that, I'm updating five things. All five have to get updated, not, not some subset of them. So the transaction example would be that the one I talked about before, where I want to move $100 out of my bank account into my shady promoter's account. So the database system doesn't provide this functionality. In my application code, I would write the steps to perform this. Right? So in the first step, I would say, well, check to see whether Andy has $100. He probably doesn't, right? Uh, but then if I do, then you can take the $100 out of my account and then put the $100 into his account. Right? Again, these are step or steps. There, there's no magic way to just materialize money in, in, in a single, at the lowest level of the hardware to automatically update something and, and, and another thing at the exact same time. Right? There's a bunch of extra stuff we'll have to do to make sure that this happens uh, atomically. But from the application's perspective, you know, they invoke this transaction and this will all happen or none of it happens. So let's talk about a really simple database system we could build that could, could, could do this for us. So let's say we have a database system that has only supports a single thread, uh, meaning only one transaction and only one query can run at a single time. And you know, if, if multiple queries or multiple transactions show up into the system, it just puts them in a queue, and there's one thread pulling things off that queue and running them one by one. So now before a transaction starts executing, what they're going to do is they're going to copy the entire database file or a set of files, what, however it's architected. It's going to make a, a, a second copy of the database, make all the changes it wants to make to that copy, and then if it succeeds and we want to save all our changes, then we just flip a pointer to say now the new version of the database is, is the second file I just created. Right? So this guarantees that atomicity property I just, I just mentioned because if I make the copy to the database and then I'm doing uh, five writes, but then the first three happen and then I crash, when I come back, I still have my original copy of the database because I didn't affect that, right? So that, you know, so everything is still correct there. That's fine. Uh, things are being written to disk. So if I crash, I could come back as long as my disk didn't die, all my data is still there. 
So would, would this actually work? He says yes. Would this be fast? He says no. Why? You, you said no, so why? It's not that, so the updates doesn't matter, right? The, the, amount of, the amount of updates I'm doing in my transaction doesn't matter because I'm copying the file every single time. So if I copy the entire file and I make one change versus a thousand changes, I, that copy cost is always the same. But you're right, the, co the copy part is expensive. If it's a one kilobyte, or sorry, a four kilobyte uh, page for my database, who cares? That's one hardware read and write. I can, I can do that pretty quickly. But if I have one petabyte of data, now for every single transaction, I'm copying one petabyte every single time uh, making my changes and then you know, f updating the pointer. So this is a good example of where we can design a system that have the properties that we want, in particular the asset properties that we'll talk about, but this is going to be super slow to do it this way. The other issue is that we're also running with a single thread. So I didn't say anything about whether the, 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 the database fits in memory or not. Right? So now if I'm running with a single thread and tries to touch data that's not in memory but it's in disk, I have to stall my thread until I go fetch it. And I can't run anything else because I only have one thread that can do this at a time. So what we're going to talk about today and, and, and for the next couple weeks is a potentially better approach where we're going to allow transactions to run simultaneously at the same time. And then we're going to come up with a way to try to potentially interleave their operations in such a way that we maximize our parallelism but still get all the safety guarantees that we want and correctness guarantees that we want in our database system. Right? And again, it's obvious why we want to do this, because we talked about this before when we talked about latching, we talked about uh, query execution. If we can get, we can allow multiple queries to run at the same time, we're going to get better utilization of our hardware, better throughput, meaning we can do more, more work in the in a same amount of time. And then the system's going to look more responsive and snappy, because now I don't have to wait in that single queue until my, until my transaction gets to that front, and then I can run. I could potentially start running right away. But now, of course, the tricky thing is going to be is that how do we actually do this interleaving uh, in a, such a way that we don't violate any of our correctness guarantees of our system and that we don't starve any one transaction uh, you know, from, from taking all the resources and other transactions can't do, do anything. So concurrency control that we're talking about today is, a, is an old concept. It goes back to the 1970s right, when, when IBM built System R. This is one of the first things they also invented. Um, and so in a disk-based system, Back then, of course, because memory was limited, and any time a transaction could touch data that's on that's on disk and not in memory, and therefore it would stall. And then now you could let other transaction to run at the same time. In modern systems today, usually for OLTP applications, they're not that big. The databases aren't that big, so we have enough memory where we could put the entire database in memory. For analytics, you still go to disk, but that, we're not doing transactions there. But so. In a, again, in a modern system, most, most of the ultimate databases can fit in memory, but now Intel is giving us more and more cores, so now we're going to allow transactions to run on different cores at the same time, and then we still need to guarantee all, all of these things. So even though the hardware is different from when, how people first invented concurrent control back in the day, we still have the same problems. We still want to maximize parallelism. And as I said a couple of times already, this is going to be really hard to do. And as I said last class, this is probably the second hardest thing to do in, in database systems, to do concurrent control. Um, and this is part of the reason why the NoSQL guys, when they first came out 10 years ago, they were like, we're, we're not doing transactions. Like, that's too hard, because they want to run faster. So it's going to be super hard for us to guarantee correctness with transactions. All right, so what happens if I only have $100 in my bank account, and I try to give money to two people at the exact same time, what should happen? Because right, I, I don't want to, you know, assuming that the bank's not going to let me overdraft, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be giving out money I don't actually have. And then it's also going to be hard to execute this very efficiently because, again, if I do the serial execution case that I talked about in the beginning, then that's going to be always correct because only one transaction is running at a time and I don't have any worries about any interleaving. But now if I do want to interleave them, uh, I want that to be as efficient as possible to be able to figure out whether I'm running correct still correctly. There's going to be some overhead to figure these things out. So, what we're essentially trying to do today, and for the next three, le three or four lectures, is allow for these interleaving of the operations of transactions. And that what, as we see is that when we start doing these interleaving, we're going to end up with inconsistent databases. Uh, and sometimes it's OK, sometimes it's not OK. 
So some inconsistencies will be okay because they're temporary. So for example, if I'm taking money out of my account and putting it in your account, again, I can't do that atomically at the hardware level. I have to do that with you know, multiple instructions or multiple operations. So there will, will be a brief period in time where I take the $100 out of my account and then before I, before I put it in your account, that $100 doesn't, doesn't exist anywhere. So that's okay because that's temporary, it's unavoidable. The outside world will not see, potentially not see that inconsistency and we'll do some protection mechanisms to make sure that they can't see this. Um, and so because, that, because we're going to allow this, this is going to allow us to actually make this all work. But the thing we want to avoid are permanent inconsistencies where, again, if I take the $100 out and then I crash and I come back, that $100 better not be missing. Right? It better, better be in the other account or my account. It can't just disappear. So in order for us to understand whether we're doing the right thing, whether we're coming up with the interleaving of our transactions that are actually correct, we need a more formal definition of what actually means to be correct. Because it's sort of obvious for us, right? Yeah, if I, if I take $100 of my account and before I put it in your account, we, we crash. Like that's sort of obvious. We know that we don't want to lose $100 or any amount of money. But from the database system's perspective, it doesn't know that it's operating on money. It just sees a bunch of bytes and it's moving them around. So we need a way for us to reason about whether we're doing the correct thing. So the first thing we need to find are what is what are these operations that we're actually doing? So as I said already, a transaction is comprised of, of one or more operations. Um, but at, at a high level, the database, the application could be, you know, update this, insert that, make these changes. But from the database system's perspective, it doesn't, doesn't know about those high level queries. It just knows that I'm doing low level reads and writes. And so the only thing that we can reason about are the things that happen to our database. So that means that if, there, if our transaction involves additional steps or procedures or operations that aren't reads and writes on the database, this is outside our purview, this is outside our control, and we can't do anything about it. So to give an example, let's say that, again, I take $100 out of my account, I put it in your account, and then I send an email to you to say the transfer succeeded. And that we want that to happen in, in the transaction. But then before I can go commit and save my changes, uh, there, there's a crash. So I've sent the email, but then I crash before I can save all the changes. That email is going out on the network because it's outside the database now, and it's going out in the real world. We can't retract that. So we can only reason about and roll back and, 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 and persist things that are these low-level reads and writes to our database. If we make a call to, you know, to an outside system or, or whatever, like that's, that's beyond us. No system can handle that, at least from what we're talking about here so far. Okay. So the database that we're going to be worried about today is going to be defined as a fixed set of arbitrary data objects that are each going to have a label or a name. So in this case here, we'll just use A, B, C, D, or we'll just use alphabet characters. So the two things to point out here are, one, I'm not defining what a database object is. It could be an attribute. It could be a tuple. It could be a page. It could be a table. It could be a database. It doesn't matter. All the same things that we'll talk about today and for the next couple couple classes, they're all still work on at, at different granularities. In practice, most of the time it's going to be based on a on a tuple. But we'll see in some cases you can take locks, you can you try to protect databases and tables. Nobody actually tries to protect single fields; that becomes too too uh, too expensive. The other thing to point out too is that I'm saying the database is a fixed size. So that means that the only operations we're going to do are reads and writes, reads or updates of existing things. We're not going to talk about inserts today. We're not going to talk about deletes. Right? The database always has the same number of things because that's going to complicate things. Uh, and we'll cover that uh, on Monday next week. So for today, just assume that we always have the same number of objects. And so now what the database is going to see is just the sequence of read and write operations on these named objects up above. So we're going to say we use the function r for a read and the function w for a write. So this is the only thing that we can see in our, in our database system. We can't see anything else, any program logic that the application may be running for, for the transaction. And that's going to limit the amount of parallelism we'll be able to get because we don't understand any, any, some, some kind of high level meaning of what the transaction is actually trying to do. We'll see one case where if you do know this, you can get better parallelism, but in practice, no, nobody does this. And we'll get to that later. So now from a practical standpoint, 
how do you actually implement or use transactions in applications and database systems today? So in the SQL standard, you have uh, these extra keywords, begin, commit, and abort. Some systems use rollback instead of abort. Uh, I think Postgres and MySQL support both. So we're going to explicitly start a new transaction with the begin keyword. And then what happens is we make we, any queries we then execute are a part of that transaction. And then the either call, I want to commit or abort. So if the user says, I want to commit, then two things can happen. Either the transaction does commit, the database saves all the changes that you made and returns back an acknowledgment to say that it was successful. Or the database system can say, you can't actually commit. I'm not going to let you make those changes. And I'm going to go ahead and shoot you and abort you, and you have to roll back. And you get a not notification that your transaction failed. Right? So just because the application calls commit doesn't mean you're actually going to commit. Again, that's a very important concept that, that we can rely on later on. If the transaction gets aborted, then any changes that we made since we called begin will get rolled back, and it'll appear as if the transaction never ran at all. So that's how we guarantee if I'm moving $100 out of my account to your account, if, if the thing fails before we put the money in your account, the transaction gets aborted, come back, and then we go back to the state we were before we started our transaction. Right? This is how we guarantee that there's no partial transactions. Yes? Why would we want to this question is, why would we want to tell the data systems you want to abort? So a lot of times there's application code where uh, you say, take, 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 for example, take the money out of my account, or I'm transferring money. So I go look at my account first, I read that, do I have $100? Yes. Now I go put, take the $100 of my account, but then I'll go read your account, and your, bank's, your, your account's been flagged fraud, so now I want to abort and roll that back, right? The simple reason. I don't know how often that occurs. Uh, I would say, I mean, most code, I want to commit, and they want to go to commit, right? But you know, we have to be able to support this. So again, the, the main thing to point out here is th this abort could either be self-inflicted, meaning we tell ourselves we want to abort, or the data system tells, tells you you have to abort. And then if you tell the system comes back and says you have to abort, uh, or, or you got aborted, then it's up for you in the application code to catch that. You get like an exception back and says, you know, I, your transaction failed, uh, and it'll suggest that you retry it. And you have to go back in the application code if you actually care about this and retry again, All right? So the correctness criteria we're going to use now for this lecture and going forth through the rest of the semester is going to be defined in terms of this ACID acronym. So ACID stands for Atomicity, Consistency, Isolation, and Durability. So atomicity is what we already talked about, where we say all the, the operations of a transaction have to occur or none of them occur, right? No partial transactions. Consistency is sort of a weird one. Uh, I'll briefly talk about it, but it's, it's very handy how it act, what it actually means, at least for a single node database system. So it, it just says that if, if the transaction is consistent, it's my doorbell, sorry. Ah, oh, fuck it. Um, the, if, if, the, if the transaction is consistent, and the database system is consistent, then when the transaction executes, then the database and state will be consistent. So now you're like, what does consistent mean? Well, at a high level, it means correctness, but then what does that mean? So again, we'll cover this in, in a few more slides. Um, this one, again, as it was originally defined by the guy that invented this, this acronym, this one was always a really hand movie one. It's, some people feel like he sort of forced this one in here in order to get the, the, the acronym to, to work out. <laughs> the other thing too is that the, the, the database lore is that he made this thing up to make, make, make fun of his wife because like his wife didn't like candy or she was like a bitter woman or something so he named it after her. I don't know whether that was true. He's German so maybe. Um, <laughs> but there's another one called base which is for uh, distributed systems or NoSQL systems and we'll cover that in a few, few more lectures. So there's acid is what we we'll care about here. Base we'll cover later. Isolation is another important one. That means that the, when our transaction executes, it should have the illusion that it's running by itself, even though other transactions may be running at the same time. And the data system will, 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 will provide that, that, that illusion for it. And then durability is where if our transaction commits and all our changes get saved, and we get back an acknowledgment that our transaction committed, then no matter what happens to the database, whether it, you know, it, it, the machine crashes, the OS crashes, the machine catches on fire, then all our changes should be persistent. And we should always be able to come back and, and see our changes. 
Our changes may get overwritten. That's okay. But for, at least for our transaction, you know, we know that all those changes got persisted. So another sort of short, shorthand way of looking at these things is you would say atomicity just means all or nothing, no parts of transactions. Consistency means it looks correct to me, and correct will be in quotes. Uh, isolation means you're running as if you're alone, and then durability means that you're going to survive all failures. So for today's class, we're going to go through each of these one by one and describe at a high level what it means to determine whether we are achieving the asset guarantee or the given property of each letter. We're going to mostly focus on atomicity and isolation. I'll briefly talk about consistency here. It doesn't really make that much sense for a single node system. It matters more for distributed systems. And then for durability, we're also not really going to talk about it too much because we'll spend a whole uh, two lectures after, uh, after I come back on, on checkpoints and logging because that's how they're going to achieve that. Okay? And I'll say also too, like, Acid is what you would get in a, if a relational data, data submitted system says they, they support transactions, this is typically what they mean. The NoSQL systems that don't do transactions, they're typically going to sacrifice often uh, atomicity, isolation, in cases, actually, some of them do get rid of everything, but uh, we'll take that offline. All right, let's talk about atomicity. So as I said already, there are two outcomes of our transaction. Either it commits and all our changes get, get, persist, or get, get <laughs> applied to the database all at once, or it gets aborted because of some, you know, either database says so or our application says so. So again, what we're providing, the guarantee we're providing to our application is that, that any transaction that, that we execute, all the changes will be atomic, meaning that they'll all appear as if they happen exactly at the same time. So again, it just means that either everything happens or none of it happens. So no matter what happens, if I say I commit, then I know everything got, got saved. So let's look at two scenarios where uh, we could have problems with atomicity, and then we'll see how we actually want to solve it. So again, my, my beloved example of taking $100 out of my account and putting it to another account, but then we, we take the money out of my account, but then the transaction gets aborted. The machine doesn't crash, the data system doesn't crash, we just get aborted. The second scenario is when you can take the $100 out, but now there's a power failure and everything that the data system is running is lost. We come back and what should be the correct state of the database, right? So there's two ways we could possibly handle this. The most common approach is to do logging. So when I say logging, I don't mean like, you know, the, the log debug messages you're using for your projects, right? I mean something like write ahead logging, where we're actually recording our file on disk, here's all that we're making. So what will happen is the data system is going to run, and as it runs a transaction, every, for every change I make to the database, every update or write I do to the database, I'm going to make a copy of what the old value was that I'm overwriting. And then that way, if I crash or if my transaction gets aborted, I have the old value sitting around, and I can go back and, and, and put it back in place. So that when my transaction gets cleaned up after an abort, all the original values were still there. Um, and so the way this is going to work is that this is going to be, we're going to maintain these undo records uh, both in memory and on disk. And that way, again, if we crash, while, if, we, if the, the transaction gets aborted while we're running, then if it's in memory, we just go reverse things real quickly. But if stuff gets written to disk and then we crash, then we have our log records or on disk that we can then load back in when we turn the data system on. And, and reconcile and put us back in the correct state. So at a high level, you can sort of think of the, the log as the black box in an airplane. Like if there's a major, uh, any, any airplane crash is a major crash. But if an airplane crashes, what, the, the government goes and looks, looks at the black box, all right, because that's going to record information about what actually is, you know, what happened in the plane at the moment that it crashed. Uh, and then it tries to figure out, you know, what, what was the error? What was the malfunction? Now, in the, in the airplane case, they, they can't put the airplane back together. In the database can, case, we can put it back together. Right? And that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're going to use that for. So, logging at a high level right, will be used by almost every single database system that's out there. Any database system that says that they're durable to disk, uh, chances are they're, they're, they're using logging. So, in addition to you know, having the, the, the ability to, to roll back things and guarantee atomicity, logging is going to provide us additional benefits uh, in terms of both performance and high level concepts or high level uh, criteria we, we may have for application or organization. So it's going to turn out that when we start talking about logging, 
since you know disks are expensive to write to, we can turn random writes into sequential writes through a log, right? And that'll make the system run faster. And then for other applications, the log is actually essentially going to be, you know, a, a, an audit trail of every single single thing, your, every single thing your application did. And then you can use that to figure out what was happening if you ever have an audit or have to have questions about, you know, my application did this at this time because the, and then there was a breach. What data got read or what data got 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 written? Um, so in a lot of financial companies, they they maintain the, they have to maintain the the log that data systems generate for the last seven years because of government regulation. So this this is a good example where I can use the log for atomicity, but also get additional benefit from it. So the other approach to guarantee atomicity that's less common is called shadow paging. And this is actually the example that I, I mentioned at the beginning of the class, where I said for every single transaction, I'm going to make a copy of the database file on disk. All my changes go to that copy, and then when my transaction commits, I just swing a pointer and say, this is now the, this is now the master version. So that's essentially what shadow paging is. Uh, but instead of copying the, the single file every single time, they'll just copy the individual pages that the transaction modifies when it runs. And then when a transaction commits, again, you, just, you swing a pointer and say, all right, all these shadow copy pages are now the master copy pages. So this is the, one of the oldest ideas in database systems. This was invented by IBM in the 1970s in system R. Uh, this turns out to be super slow and problematic um, for managing data on disk. And when IBM went to go build DB2, which is the second data system, relational database system they built after uh, system R, they didn't do any of this. They went with the, the logging approach. Because you end up with uh, you know, fragmentation, you end up with un unordered data sets, um, and, it gets, and it gets slower. So as far as I know today, the only two database systems that actually do this shadow paging approach is CouchDB and uh, LMDB. Um, like I said, it's for performance reasons, it's not that common. Everyone else is gonna do, is gonna do logging. So this is, question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, this. This one? No, no. Keep going? This one. So for this one, so, so this one is, it's the same operation. Take money out of my account, put it in your account. This is like, we get aborted. Like the user says, abort my transaction. Everything's still in memory. How do I roll that back? This is like a hard crash. How do I come back from that? And so the point I was trying to make here was, the, the log information is going to reside both in memory and eventually also get written out to disk. Because if it's in memory, then I can quickly go get it and flip, you know, flip back the old values, right, if I abort. If I do a hard crash, if it's on disk, then I can reverse things potentially, right, when I, when I, when I load the system back up. Because again, after a hard crash, all the contents of our buffer pool are gone, and we need to, we, and, you know, we need to figure out what, what was happening at the system at the time at the crash to put us back in the correct state. Yes? So this question is, does this require writing the disk for each transaction? Yes, if you care about this. If you care about not losing data, yes. We'll cover that later. Is there any like, use case where like, doing shadow paging is beneficial and that's why they capture DB and you LMDB. Um, his question is, is there any, why would you ever actually want to do this? I, if you, it doesn't work, right? So we, uh, so we, a few years ago, my, one of my first, my first PhD student, he and I started building a new system uh, using like the new Intel non-volatile memory devices. And we thought at, at the time that with really fast storage, uh, like non-volatile memory is like almost as fast as DRAM, with really fast storage uh, to do random access, that shadow paging would actually turn out to be a, a better approach. Like taking an old idea from the 70s and running it on like today's hardware. It doesn't work. Right hand logging is always going to be faster because you can do these sequential writes. You know, you can batch a bunch of things together and then shove them out all the disk at once. With shadow paging, it's all this fragmentation. You're copying things every single time. It becomes very expensive. We'll see multi-version concurrency control, which is sort of like this, but you, you, instead of copying an entire page before I make a change, I maybe just copy a tuple or a subset of the tuple. So shadow paging is sort of how multi-version current control works, but it's shadow paging as defined by IBM is nobody does it except for these guys. Yes? 
Um, so for the first approach, is it not possible that um, you fail after you do an action, but before you actually log that? To the logging stuff? Yeah, yeah so, so I don't want to spend too much time on, on how, writing out the disk, but the question is, is it the case that I, if I do a bunch of changes, I create some, some undo, undo records that are in memory, but then I crash before it's written out the disk, is that a problem? No, because when I come back, all my mem memory's gone, and the, therefore, I'm going to load the database back up based on how it was on disk. And so because those changes never got persisted to disk, they're, 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 they're as if they never happened. So his question, uh, which, is, which is a good point, is that do I have, does this mean I have to do, if I, if I, if I want to say my transaction is committed, do I have to do an S-sync? Do I have to do a flush every single time my transaction commits? And I, the answer is yes, but you don't really do it on every single commit. You batch a bunch together and then do a group commit when you flush them out all together. And that amortizes the F-sync cost over time. But if you, if you want to guarantee that your data is actually uh, durable, you have, to, you have to write the disk. Well, see, and so, but the tricky thing is going to be how, in what order you write to disk is going to matter a lot too. So you have to make sure you write the log record that corresponds to a change to a data page first before you write the data page to disk. We'll, cover, we'll spend a whole day on, on, on this as well. And at the point I was trying to make, I made about like, oh, well, the NoSQL guys don't always provide ACID. Th some of them would actually not even flush to disk. When you, if they had transactions, they would not flush to disk exactly when you say, you know, complete my transaction. They would sort of every, do it every, I don't know, 60 seconds. So that means you could crash and lose the last 60 seconds of data. Some systems were even worse than this. Uh, I'll just say it straight up, Mongo, right? The early version of Mongo was when you do a write, it would immediately come back and say, yeah, I got your right. But it didn't actually even do the right. Like at the network layer, it said, yeah, I got it. And if you wanted to make sure that your right actually occurred, you had to come back a second time and say, did you actually do that? And that was the default for them for like four or five years. And their early benchmark numbers were amazing because like they would do these rights. And of course, it's like, yeah, yeah, I did it. No problem. Right? But it didn't actually do it. That's not, Mongo fixed that. It's not the default anymore. OK. So any questions about atomicity? Again, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the, how we actually guarantee this uh, in, in a second. So consistency, as I said before, is this nebulous term um, about correctness of the database. So at a high level, the way to think about this, what a database actually is, is trying to model some, some concept or aspect of the real world. Like my, my database for my bank is trying to model the old days of a bank where somebody would sit in a, in a ledger and record how much money you actually had in your account. Right? It's modeling some, some process in the real world. So we're going to say that if we have our database be logically correct, meaning we don't care how it's actually, actually physically stored, but the data integrity, the referential integrity, all those things are correct, then any questions we ask about our database will produce correct results. And again, that sounds very vague, so let me go in more detail. There's two types of consistency we could possibly have. We have database consistency and transaction consistency. The spoiler would be database consistency is the one we actually care about. We actually we can't do the second one, and we'll see why in a second. So again, the, our correctness criteria is that our database accurately reflects what the real world looks like. And so the, how do we actually enforce that? Well, we provide the data system with integrity constraints to say, this is, this is what it means for us to have correct data. So for example, if I have a, a, a table of people or students, and I'm keep, keeping track of their age, I can have an integrity constraint that says nobody's age could be less than zero. Right? There's no negative, ne negative ages. Uh, and so the data system could enforce that. If someone tries to insert somebody with a negative age, it can say, That's, you, know, you can't have that in the real world. I can't let you uh, insert that data. The other way to think about it too also is that the so now, in addition to the integrity constraints, now as transactions start making changes to the database, that any transaction that executes in the future should be able to see the changes, the correct, the, the correct changes that a transaction in the past made. So what does that mean? So if I have a transaction, say I want run a transaction right now, and I make some change to the database, if you now run a transaction one minute later, as long as nobody has overwritten my changes, I, you should be able to see my, my updates. So in a single node database, this is not that big, you know, this is not that big of a deal. Right? So my transaction commits, I give back the acknowledgement that I committed, 
then you come along and now do another transaction on, the, on that same machine, and you read my you, you should be able to read my writes right away. So for, for a single node database, this is not that big. This is not really an issue. Where this matters more is the distributed databases. So now if I'm trying to guarantee strong consistency in my, in my distributed database, if I do a write and I update some, some account, uh, and then you come one millisecond later on another machine for the same logical database but on a separate physical machine, and you start you now do a read, you should be able to see my change if I, if I told the outside world that my transaction committed. All right, so th this will matter more for, again for the distributed databases because the NoSQL guys will have this thing called eventual consistency where I'll say, I'll propagate changes eventually uh, and not guarantee that everyone sees the exact same state of the database at the exact same time. But for our purposes today, a single node database, it, it doesn't really make sense. Right? It, it, it won't be an issue. So the other type of consistency is transactional consistency. And th this one, is, again, is very hand wavy. But it basically says that if a database is consistent before a transaction runs, and our transaction is, is consistent, then after we run our transaction, the end state of the database should be consistent. All right, so what does it mean to be you know, consistent or correct? Right, that's a higher level concept that we can't reason about in our database. Right? We can try to enforce some, some integrity constraints uh, and we prevent the transaction from doing, uh, you know, making some changes, but you know, if, if my application says there should be no customer with an account uh, that has you know, at cmu.edu email address and my transaction go ahead, goes ahead and actually tries to do that, I, I can't stop that in my database. That's not a bad, that's not a good example because I, you know, it's, let me rephrase that. Let's say there's, the application says that nobody taking this class is allowed to have an account on my, my on this one system. But my database doesn't have access to whether you're enrolled in this class or not. So the transaction is allowed to go ahead and do that. And the database says, okay, sure, you, you want to do this insert? I'm, I'm allowed to do that. But that's this higher level concept this higher level constraint that the data system doesn't know anything about, so therefore the transaction is actually inconsistent, and therefore we can't stop that. So again, this is this is something that we can't simply just can't do in our database system. We can we can enforce integrity constraints, referential integrity constraints. We can't enforce this, these higher level things because we just don't know. Because right? it's, it's a human value judgment that we we can't codify in our system. So there's 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 nothing really else to say about this. Like, I, if you understand the high level of what I'm talking about, then that's it, right? That's all that matters. Okay. All right. So the one, the other one we care about today is also isolation. So isolation again is saying that if our transaction, if we if, if we have our user submitting users are submitting bunch of transactions, we want each of them to run, uh, assuming that they're running by themselves. And the reason why we want to provide this this guarantee is that. It's a, it makes it way easier to program our application or our logic in our transactions if that's the case. We assume that we have exclusive access to the database. We don't have to worry about any intermediate uh, uh, data we, we could be reading from other transactions. Then you know, we just write our single thread of code and that's fine. And it makes our life easier. So we can achieve, the, we can achieve this by doing, again, my straw man approach in the beginning where I just have a single thread execute one by one. But I said that we want to be able to interleave transactions uh, to achieve better parallelism and concurrency. And so we if you want to be able to guarantee this illusion of property, but we still want to inter interleave this, that becomes difficult. And so the way we're going to provide this, the way we're going to do this, is through a concurrent control protocol. So we've already talked about concurrent control protocols slightly when we talked about index latching. Right? We're going to have a single data structure and allow multiple threads to access it at the same time, and we use our latches to enforce the, the correctness uh, of our data structure. So now we're going to do the same thing, but for our database objects. And this is why I was making a distinction between locks and latches. So latches are protecting the internals of the data structure. Locks are going to protect these database objects. So you can think of a current control call as like the traffic cop for, for the database system. Right? It's, it's sitting saying, okay, this, this, this we can let this operation go, this operation has to wait, or this operation has to abort. It's, it's trying to figure out how to interleave things in a way that we end up with the correct state. So there's two categories of protocols that we're going to care about, and then this will, this is what we'll cover uh, on, on next week, right? It'll, it'll, it'll be both of these. So the first one is a pessimistic protocol, 
where we're going to assume that our transactions are, are going to conflict to cause problems. So we require them to re acquire locks before they're allowed to do anything. Right? You assume that, that, that you know, you're pessimistically assume that there's gonna be problems. So you 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 make sure that there's you make sure that things go in the correct order by using locks. Optimistic concurrent control is where you assume that the, the conflicts are rare. Most of the time my transactions aren't gonna conflict. So rather than making them stall and acquire locks at the very beginning, I just let them run uh, and do whatever they want. And then when they go to commit, go back and figure out whether that was actually the right thing to do, whether there was a conflict. So Monday's class next week will be on two-phase locking. That's a pessimistic protocol. Wednesday's class next week will be on timestamp ordering. That's considered an optimistic protocol. An optimistic concurrent control protocol was actually invented here at CMU in the 1980s. All right, so let's look now uh, at some, some real examples and start understanding what does it actually mean to have conflicts. So again, this is my bank account uh, example uh, where we have two accounts, A and B. It's Andy and his bookie. Um, and so we want to transfer $100 out of my account into my bookie's account. But then at the same time, the bank's going to run a transaction where it's going to update the, you know, the monthly interest of all the bank accounts. So we're going to update every account with an add 6% interest. All right, so transaction one is take $100 out of A, put $100 in B. And then transaction two is just computing, you know, in incrementing both of the accounts by adding 6%. So if we assume that, again, both bank accounts have, have $1,000. And we want to execute these two transactions. What are the possible outcomes we could have for the state of the database? All right, assuming we have arbitrary interleavings. Well, many, right? Because we could have T1 maybe go do run, run one query, then switch over to T2, then back and forth. Right? There's a, it's a bunch of different ways we could end up with these interleavings. But the important thing to point out, though, is that at the end of the day, after we execute transaction T1 and T2 in any possible order, to know that our database state is correct, the final result uh, when we add both the accounts together should be 2120. Because I have $1,000 in A and $1,000 in B. Add that together, that's 2000 And then the second transaction wants to add 6% interest. So we want to guarantee that no matter how we order or interleave our operations, we always, at the end, after executing T1 and T2, we end up with 2120. So now this is a very important property about transactions and database systems. That, that's going to be slightly different than maybe how you, you, you know or have experienced parallel programming before. So in a database system that, that we're talking about here, even though T1 may be submitted to the data system first, followed by T2, there's no guarantee that a database system is going to run T1 first. Right? And the reason why we're going to do this is because, because we can have any possible interleaving or any, any possible ordering, then this is going to allow us to, to open up more opportunities to do interleavings to get better parallelism. If I cared, if, if my application absolutely had to care, say, well, T1 absolutely has to execute first, then followed by T2, the way you would write that code is you would submit T1, and then only when you get back to the acknowledgement that T1 committed, then you submit T2. Because you can't guarantee that. Now, in practice, if you, if you submit T1 and if, you know, it takes a minute, then you submit T2, that's basically the same thing. But if I, if I submit them at exactly the same time, then the data system could interleave them any, any way it wants. But what we're going to care about, though, is that for any arbitrary interleaving, we want the end state of the database to be equivalent to one where we actually executed these transactions in serial order with a single thread. Either T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1. The end state of the database has to look like that. So now that means that the, the, the number of possible outcomes we could have are for the state of A and B could be different. Right? So if I have, say, T1 go first followed by T2, I'll have $954 in, in A and, and $1166 in B. But if I go in the other order, I'll have $960 and $1160. But again, if I add both of these together, I always get 2120. And that's, again, that's equivalent to one where they execute in, in serial order. Is this clear? All right, so let's actually look at what the database sees. So for this, these, this, this, is, this is called a schedule for our transactions. And the way to read this is that going from the top to the bottom or forward time, 
Uh, and then for each of these columns here, we have the transactions and we have the operations that, are, that they're actually doing. So I call begin on T1, I take $100 out of A, take, put $100 in B, and then I call commit. And then now next in time, I do a context switch over here, and now I, I call T1 and it computes the interest in these guys. So for this, assume that we only have a single thread that can, with a single program counter, and we can only execute one operation at a time. Right? We can interleave them with these different transactions, but at any given time set, we can only do one thing. So in this case here, if we execute T1 followed by T2, we end up with this. This amounts for A and B. If we execute T2 first followed by T1, we end with the, these amounts here. So again, A doesn't match. A is 954 over here and 960 over here. So they're technically different from a, you know, from a, from a finite exact amount. But from a database assistance perspective, for what we're caring about with transactions, you add them both up and you always get 2120. So both of these interleavings, or both of these orderings are still are equivalent to each other. They're correct. Yes? So I think your question, her question is, if you know that you have these two, two transactions at exactly the same time, could you do it where like you could you combine them? Yeah. Uh, yes, but nobody does it that way, and I think that would complicate things right now. Let's just assume that this is the case. I'll also, say too, what I'm showing here are like, yeah, here's why. Here's why you can't really do that. So what I'm going to talk about here today are like the, the schedule is fixed, meaning I know ahead of time exactly what all the transactions actually want to do. In a real system, it's not like that. In a real system, you have like, you know, transactions are showing up. They're calling, you know, a client opens a connection, calls begin, and then it starts executing a bunch of queries, and you don't know what the next query is. In this case here, to sort of, sort of to reason about correctness, you see everything all at once, right? So on Monday, when we talk about two-phase locking, that's a dynamic concurrency protocol where you don't know what the queries are going to be ahead of time. Now, there's some cases where if you have some introspection about what the application is actually trying to do, then you can actually do what you propose, but that's hard and nobody actually does that. Um, like, so for each of those operations, do, is, it like, is the client essentially calling like get A, compute A minus 100, send A minus 100? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So, so, so his question is, which, which is correct, I said before the data system only sees reads and writes. What are this a equals a minus one, right? Yes, that will get translated to a read followed by a write. We'll see that in a sec. Yes. Yes. Does that mean that like since these can be interleaved somehow, like you imagine that like in T two, T two has to have its own separate copy of what A was when T two started, and yeah. T one has to have its own separate copy of what A was when T two. Started. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. So, so his question is, so. This A equals A minus 100, what is that actually going to look like? Well, in the program logic, I would say do a get on A, do a read on A, have a copy of my local variable, then I can manipulate it, and then write it back to the database. So each of these two transactions would have their own local variables that aren't shared. So we can't interleave operations between within the transaction. His question is, can you interleave the operations between transactions? Yes, we'll get there in a sec. Yes? The question is, if I have two transactions that are touching completely different objects, not tuples, objects, uh, do I need to still serialize this? Well, I mean, so for this one, I'm just trying try, try to show equivalency. If they touch completely different things and there's no conflicts, then you can interleave them any way you want. Absolutely, yes. So how, how, how do I know that another thread is touching a different? Her question is, how do I know whether another transaction is touching the same thing I'm touching? Yeah. Again, for, this is a high-level example. The database sees and reads and writes. So I do, I do a read on object A. You do a read on object A. In order for me to serve your read request, it asks me to read it for you. So I see everything. But I don't see higher level things like I don't see that you're you're that you're going to take the value of a and then add six percent to it. So again, what, what everyone's sort of we're getting up to now is be able to interleave these these transactions or inter interleave the operations. And we've already covered this. We want to do this because disk is slow and our, 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 we have a lot of CPU cores. Um, and so the idea here is again that 
instead of having the, you know, if we have to go to disk to get something or, or wait, wait to acquire a latch on something, we could have one transaction stall, another transaction keep on running and still make forward progress. So we're trying to figure out a schedule at interleaving such that we maximize the, the performance of the system and we, and we get the best utilization of our hardware. So if we go back here now to our example, so now I'm interleaving our transactions, right? One starts, takes $100 out of A, then, then it does a contact switch, T2 starts, put, computes 6% on, on A, then we go back, take, put the $100 back on B, and we go back here and compute the, compute the interest on in that, and then we go commit. So now, again, now it's not one transaction running, running in its entirety at a time, right? We're now able to actually interleave things. And this example here, this is correct. This is fine because this is, this is equivalent to a serial ordering of our transactions, right? The end state of the database is, is equivalent, right? And so the key thing to point out here is that the reason why this worked out okay and then we end up equivalent is that we always make sure that we did the operations on T1 first on a given object before we did that operation on, on T2 for that same object. So I took $100 at A, and then I computed the interest on A, and then I took, put the $100 back on B, and then I computed the interest on B. Right? So for this, inter for this interleaving here, it's, it, we, we violate that. So I take $100 out at of at A, I compute the interest on A, then I compute the interest on B, then I put the hundred dollars back on B. So now, in this case here, the when I add up these two values together, I don't get twenty one twenty. I get twenty fourteen. So the bank lost, you know, uh, ten dollars or one hundred six dollars. Right? Now, who cares? It's one hundred six dollars, but if it's a billion dollars, right? I, if it's your account, one hundred dollars is a lot. But like, you know, this is why we want to guarantee that we always have correctness with transactions especially when you're doing any, anything that involves money. There's a famous example a few years ago where some Bitcoin exchange, I forget where in the world, was running on MongoDB. MongoDB did, at the time didn't have support transactions. And so some hacker figured out that you can have, uh, you can manipulate the, the, the API and have it drain out everyone's account. So they, 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 they you know, wiped out the, the, the Bitcoin exchange in a single day because MongoDB wasn't doing transactions. It's part of the story, but... Uh, they didn't have transactions, that's a bad idea. So again, back to his point, well, what is the database system actually seeing? Again, it doesn't see these higher level operations, it just sees these reads and writes. And so essentially what we're trying to do is make sure that for any object that does uh, a read or does a write or a read on the object, if another transaction is doing the same thing, we're always going in, in, in the right order to determine whether our schedule is correct. So the way we're going to figure this out, the way we're going to define correctness for what we're talking about here today is we'll say that a schedule of any arbitrary ordering of operations is correct if it's equivalent to one of a serial schedule. So the serial schedule we've already talked about, the serial schedule is just saying that we execute transactions one after another and no interleaving. And then the equivalency policy says that if the final state of the database is uh, of, of of the of the, the objects is equivalent or it has it acts like the same values of another database state then they are equivalent so a a ordering of a schedule will be, could be equivalent to at least one exactly one serial ordering and not exactly one one or more serial orderings if the database is still the same state but a given schedule could be correct it could still be serializable uh, by being equivalent to any possible serial ordering. So this is the formal property that we're going to care about for our schedules, serializability. Okay, it just says that a schedule is that is equivalent to some serial execution. Doesn't matter which one; it has to be it has to be one of them. If that it's equivalent to that serial ordering, then whatever schedule we're looking at is considered to be serializable. And this is the gold standard of what you want to get in a database management system. Right, this this is this is guaranteeing almost guaranteeing all the protections you could ever want. The only one it doesn't guarantee is that if your transaction, if T1 shows up first followed by T2, T1 will commit first. That's called strict serializability or external consistency. We don't care about that here. Most systems don't provide that. The only system that provides that, that I'm aware of, is Google Spanner. And they need it for some, you know, some, some global ads thing.
systems don't do that. Those systems, if they, if they say they support serializability, they're getting, uh, you're getting what, what I'm defining here. Okay? So, again, coming, if you come from a background from parallel programming, this might seem kind of weird that I could say, all right, well, I can have the, uh, the, you know, there's not one single state of the database that I can say this is what it exactly should be to determine whether it's correct, right? It could be any possible thing, right? And the reason why we want to do this is because if we have multiple choices for how we want to interleave our operations and multiple serial orderings uh, that we could, that we could uh, aspire to achieve, then that gives us more options to decide how we want to schedule our operations for our transactions. So to understand this bit better, we now, now need to form a way to determine what it means to have a conflict that could violate the serial ordering or serializability of a transaction. So what we're going to say is that two transactions or two operations are going to conflict if they're, if they're being run by different transactions at the same time and they're both operating on the same object. And at least one of those operations is a write. So there's three types of anomalies we're going to care about. We have read-write, write-read, and write-write. Again, why no read-read conflicts? Does, yeah, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Like, if, I, if you read something and I read something, we read the same thing, that's fine. Who cares? It's when we have writes, and when at least one of the operations is a write, is when we have problems. So, so let's go through each of these one by one. So the first one is read-write uh, conflicts. All right, this is also some, sometimes called a repeatable read. So let's say I have two transactions, T1, T2. T1 is going to do a read on A and then read on A again. T2 is going to read on A followed by a write on A. So let's say I actually run this. Uh, T1 starts, does the read on A, gets $10 out of my bank account. Then there's a context switch. We start running T2. T2 reads on A, sees $10. That's, that's fine. But then it writes back $19. Then it goes ahead and commits. And we get back the acknowledgement from the database system to say that our transaction committed. But then now our transaction switches back, or the contact switch back over to T1. T1 now does a read, and it get, gets back 19. But the first time I read A, I got 10. So I'm trying to read the same object, and I'm not getting the same value. Right, so that's an unrepeatable read. I, I, if I try to read something, I, I'm not seeing the same thing over and over again. And again, if we're trying to guarantee isolation in, for our transactions, it should not see this, this change over here, because it, if we're running this with, in serial ordering, T1 should have just run completely and then finished, and then T2 would have ran. Right? So that, that couldn't happen under a serial order. Next conflict is write read, also sometimes called dirty reads. So, so now T1 is going to do a read on A followed by a write on A, and then T2 is going to do, also do a read on A followed by a write on A. T1 reads A, sees $10, then it writes back $12. Now T, T2 reads A, and it sees the $12 that the first guy put in, right? But then now it writes back $14. Then it goes ahead and commits, and then you know, we, we get back the acknowledgement from the database system and say, yeah, you committed, you're good to go. But now when we do our context switch, we come back over here, and now our first guy aborts. So we said there's no partial transactions. So this, this guy has to abort. So we need to roll back our update. But the problem was that this other transaction here already read my update. And then it committed. And it told the outside world that, yeah, when I read A, I saw, I saw $12. But that shouldn't have happened. Because again, we, we can't, that's a temporary inconsisten inconsistency. We made a change to A that you know, we have to make the change in order to actually you know, apply the change to the database, but nobody should, should have been able to see that change because our transaction didn't commit. And furthermore, because we aborted, now we, we leak something into the outside world that shouldn't, shouldn't have appeared. The last conflict is write writes, and this is over, overwriting un, uncommitted data. So T1 does a write on A, puts in $10. T2 does a, read, a write on A, puts in $19 without reading it. Then it updates B and puts in Andy. And then over here, uh, T2, or T1 starts running again, and then it writes in Bieber. So now when we go to commit, what's the issue? Well, I have two objects, A and B. And so for, for A, I'm seeing the, the write that the T2 put in there. It put in $19. <laughs> but for object B, I'm seeing Justin Bieber, because that's what T1 put in. So I have a torn update. 
right? I have, I have data that, uh, I have two objects that have been modified by two different transactions when they both should have been modified atomically by one transaction. And this occurred because, uh, you know, this guy got to go, got to go run in, while this guy was still running. And that shouldn't happen if we were trying to guarantee serial ordering. So now, given these conflicts, uh, we need to understand more formally you know, how to actually prove whether something's uh, actually serializable. So in the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip conflict serializability. Or sorry, you definitely need to know conflict serializability. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip view serializability. Uh, conflict serializability is what you need to know for the, um, for the homeworks. Uh, I'll post on, on Piazza the link to the lecture from last class last year that talks about view serializability. Right, it's, it's, it's the same material that I would have covered, but we're, we're out of time. All right, so most data systems are going to try to give you this. If they say they support serializable execution or transactions, the serializable, serializable isolation level, they'll give you this. Nobody does this one, because this requires high-level information about what the application is trying to do, and we can't get that automatically. All right, so now we're going to define our, uh, a new term and say that two schedules are considered to be conflict equivalent if and only if they are involved in the same set of operations and transactions uh, running at, at the same time, and then every pair of conflicting transactions are ordered in the same way. So again, a conflicting transactions when where they're actually trying to update, trying to do a read or write on an object, right? Two transactions, one's either a read or a write, and one's either a read or a write. They always have to have at least one write. So we'll say a schedule S is conflict serializable if it's conflict equivalent to some serial schedule. So uh, the way we're going to figure out how to determine whether something's conflict serializable is by just swapping the order of non-conflicting operations. The idea is that we can do these swapping steps on, on our operations, and that'll sort of push a bunch of operations to the top for one transaction, push a bunch of operations to the bottom for another transaction, until we end up with a serial order. So going back to this example here, so we do a read on A, follow write on A, and read on A, read on B, follow write on B for T1 and T2. So we have here, we, we want to start swapping here. So we have a read on B and a write on A. So th this case here, they're not touching the same object. So I can go ahead and swap their order. I can make read, a, read on B happen before the write on A. Same thing for the next one here. The read on B can happen before the read on A. I can swap their order. That's fine. Now I can do the same thing with this other one. The read on, write on B can happen before the read on A. Write on A, swap that. The write on B can happen before the, the read on A can swap. So I can do that. So now I end up with a serial ordering. Right? It's, it's, it's equivalent to this one here. So this is the one where you can't do this. So in this case here, I have a write on A followed by a write on A. I can't swap their order. So therefore, it's, it's not equivalent to a serial ordering. Right? This is pretty straightforward. But of course now, this is kind of like stupid to do. right? Like what if I have a lot of uh, transactions and I have a lot of operations? This is going to be very expensive for me to do. So we need a better way to figure out, uh, to determine whether something is, is going to be serializable or not without having to do this, the swapping thing. And so the way we can do this is through a dependency graph. And the textbook, I think, calls this a, a precedence graph. So a dependency graph is just going to say, we're going to have a node for every single transaction in our schedule, and that we'll have an edge between two transactions if there's some operation in one transaction and conflicts with another operation in the other transaction, and the first operation occur occurs earlier in the schedule than the other, other transaction, right? And so if I look at my entire schedule and I generate my dependency graph, if I see a cycle, then I know that it's not serializable because I won't be able to swap their ordering. But if there's no cycles, then it is conflict serializable. So let's look at this example here that we had before. So in this case here, I have a write on A followed by a, re a read on A. So the write on A conflicts with the read on A, obviously. And the write on A in T1 happens before the read on A in T2. So I'll have an edge from T1 to T2, and I label it for the object A. Same thing here. I have a write on B followed by a read on B. So I have an edge from T2 to T1 on B. And then now at this point, I have a cycle. So therefore, I know that this, this ordering is not complex serializable. Again, just looking at the code, this is the, the Justin Bieber example I had before. I do a read on A, followed by a write on A here, then read on A, followed by write on A, read on B, followed by write on B, then read on B, followed by write on B. So I would have the update to B ha occur from T1, 
and the update to A would occur to T2, and that's a torn update. So let's get, let's get even crazier now. Right? We, we can have an arbitrary number of transactions. So in this case here, I have a read on B and a write on B. So I have an edge from T2 to T1 on B, and just keep going down the line one by one, right? And then we end up something like this. So the question is, is this, is this considered equivalent? Yes, because we can take any arbitrary, we take the ordering T2, T1, T3, and that'll end up with uh, the correct serial ordering that we want it. So by, if we generate the dependency graph, we just look to see whether we have a, a, a cycle, that'll tell us whether we're, we're conflict serializable or not. Okay? All right, actually, we have a little bit more time. We, we keep going. Okay. Um, let's look, let's bring back now the operations we had uh, before, these higher level things that the application may want to do. So now we still have our reads and writes, but now I'm showing you like what the program actually is program logic is actually doing. So the reads and writes are always going to the database, but any of these other operations like you know b equals b plus 10, these are happening within the, 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 the transaction state. So any change I make to b is not written to the database until I actually do the write on b. All right. So in this case here, uh, I, I, the other thing to point out too is like what we're doing in this one here, we're taking $10 out of one account uh, and then putting $10 in this account. The second transaction, I just want to compute the sum of the total amount of money that are in a and b. And then this is like this fake echo command. This is not a real thing. I'm just showing this for demonstration purposes. This is just printing out to you, returning the actual the sum of the two values. So in this case here, right, we, would, we want to generate a dependency graph. We have a write on A and a read on A. So we have an edge from T1 to T2 on A. But then down here, we have a read on, write on B and a read on B. So we would ha have an edge going the other direction on B. So we have a cycle. So therefore, this is not conflict serializable. But... There is actually a way for, uh, for if we can mod, we could potentially modify this application and do something different than just computing the sum this way, where we could end up with something that would still follow, end up in the same state as a serial ordering of a transaction, but it would actually not be conflict serializable because of this cycle up here. So instead of just me going reading A and then adding to my sum and reading B and adding to my sum, what if instead of actually giving them the exact sum for both accounts, what if I just want to know what, what are the total number of accounts that have more than zero dollars? I'm, I'm computing a counter of the, the, the number of accounts that are greater than, greater than zero. So if, if I rewrote my application to say if a greater than equal to zero, add one to my counter, then in that case, when I print out my count, or even though I interleaved my, my, my transaction while T1 was still running and that, that money was missing, assuming that I didn't have exactly $10 and, and it didn't go negative, then this thing would actually still produce the correct result. So what's up with that? That's kind of weird, right? I, I said conflict serializability says that I need to end up the same state of the, same state of the database or the same result as if I was running a serial ordering. But in this case here, I'm not conflict serializable, but I am still getting the, the same result on the same uh, uh, state of the database as if I was running in a serial ordering. So this is what view serializability is. And again, the spoiler is that nobody actually does this because this requires us to have some reasoning about what the hell is the application or transaction actually trying to do here to know whether it's okay for me to interleave them by plopping these guys in the middle of these other ones here. So this is what I was saying. Nobody actually does this, but it's actually a really interesting concept. And eventually, you know, maybe 50 years from now, People have better programming models and programming application frameworks where we could actually do view serializability, but it, does, it doesn't exist today. It's only theoretical. So let's look at another example here. So we have three transactions running. T1 wants to do a read on A followed by a write on A, and then T2 and T3 are doing what are called blind writes on A. So we're writing to A without actually reading it first, which we, we could do. So again, if I just go through and generate my dependency graph, uh, we're going to generate a bunch of edges, and we, we have a cycle. So we therefore we know that it's that it's not conflict serializable. But if I just actually look at the transaction a little bit, well, I see well. Assuming that these are the only transactions that are running at this right now, which we said we said was the case. T1 does a read on A followed by write on A. T2 does a write on A. But at the end of the day, the end state of the database, the only thing that matters is this last write on T3. So this ordering here is actually view, view equivalent to one where I executed them in this order like this. 
So as long as T3 is the last write that, get, that, that gets persisted to the database A, who cares how these other ones up here got interleaved? But I need to know that in my, in my application, it's okay for this thing to be the last writer. And as I said, next class, when we start talking about two-phase locking, transactions are showing up in arbitrary orderings at, at, at different times that, you know, during, during execution, and you don't know exactly what they're going to be doing ahead of time, so you can't guarantee this. So just real quick, let's skip, skip all this. Um, the way to think about the, the schedules that we talked about is that you have this universe of all possible orderings of schedule, or all possible schedule orderings you could have for any, for any transaction in, in, your, in your application, right? That's this giant space here. It's any possible ordering, but, but you're not even regarding, you're not even considering what it means to be correct or not. The, then you have a smaller portion here of the serial ordering. Right? These are ones where we're executing transactions one after another. And then around that would be conflict serializable, where, again, these are some interleavings that may not be serial. It includes all serial orderings, but it includes the ones that aren't. And then around that will be the view serializable uh, orderings. Yes? Uh, in the previous example. Yes. Going back. Why actually did you just consider about the last write in T3 and not about the order in T1 and T2? Because, again, so say the, the, this is what I'm given, and I want to say run these transactions. Again, I'm not worried about a transaction showing up arbitrarily. I'm saying this is what I have. I want to run this right now. What's the end? There's only one object in the database. So the only thing I'm going to see after I run these transactions is what's the, what's the value of A? And so who cares that T1 and T2 wrote A because T3 is going to overwrite it? So at the end of the day, all that matters is whatever this guy wrote. Who cares what these guys actually did? Well, correct. This will not work in the first example. What, 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 what is the first example? Uh, money getting directed. Yeah, taking money out of one account, put in another account. And at the same time, the... Computing the interest? Yes. Oh. Right, this is just meant to illustrate the, the concept. Okay. So, I'm going to skip all this. For, for tr transaction durability, we've already covered this. That, that's the logging stuff. Again, we'll spend a whole week on this. Um, the asset properties we've already covered, adamacy consisting isolation. Today, we mostly focus on these two. We'll cover this more distributed databases. We'll cover this for logging and checkpoints. But for next week, we're going to focus on these, these two further. So the, the last thing I just sort of say, too, is that uh, concurrent control is hard. It's hard to get correct, hard to get perform well. This is why a lot of new da newer database systems that come along, uh, except for more recently, they initially did not support transactions because they said they want to get best performance. And they, they didn't worry about, uh, you know, running transactions. They wanted to make sure the system was always available. And, you know, they, they, they didn't want to burden, burden themselves with transactions. And so the, the thing I always like to point out, though, is Google in the 19, or 2004, 2005, they were sort of the harbinger or the vanguard of the NoSQL system. They put out this thing called Bigtable. They said joins are slow, SQL is slow, transactions are slow. We're not going to do any of that. And then, like, Seven or eight years later, after everyone sort of copied what Google had done, like Cassandra, Mongo, uh, a bunch of other key value stores, HBase, they came out with this paper called on Spanner, which is their transactional database system that they use internally. And there's this great line in the paper that says that uh, for, for their programmers, they think it's better to provide an abstraction or programming model that uses transactions because that's easier for them to reason about the correctness of the program and whether they're actually doing the, you know, the, the right operations in the right order. It's better for to have the, the, you know, the, the, the unwashed masses, your average you know, rando JavaScript program or whatever they're using. You have them all programmed to using the transaction programming model. And then instead you have a bunch of really smart people that can do the systems development, like Jeff Dean. Their job is to worry about how to make those transactions go faster. So transactions are super important. Every system that they didn't have them before is now trying to start to add them. Because again, it, it's, it provides all these nice guarantees that you want to have in your system. Okay? Again, I'm rushing. I apologize, but I quickly want to get through Project 3 real quickly. All right, so Project 3 is out. What you're building is the query execution engine for BusTub. So what you're going to end up implementing is the executors for the actual uh, query plan operators. So say you have a query plan like this. Then for each of these operators, you're going to generate this executor that's going to follow the iterator model that we talked about, 
where they all have a next function that shoves up, you know, you call next on the op on the executor, and it gives you back either uh, the next tuple that it has or a null pointer to say that it's it's done. Okay, so you guys are doing it's gonna be single thread execution, no exchange operators, uh, and you don't have to worry about transactions. You don't you don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know doing updates or deletes. So what do you have to what do you have to build? So the first thing we're asking you to do is build out the catalog. This allows you to install install tables into the database, and then go back and get those tables back uh, from the catalog using the name or, or the internal internal identifier. And then you're building executors for inserts, sequential scans, hash joins, and hash aggregation. For the hash join, you can implement it first using a uh, you know in memory hash table that will provide you. But the ultimate goal is that you want to use your linear probe hash table that you built from Project Two, because that allow you to do joins for on tables that don't fit in disk. So you can do the first two tasks without having to do the have a working linear probe hash table. But the last one will require you to have that one working. So uh, implement the catalog and start to execute it first, because obviously you can't do special scans unless you have data in your database. Uh, you don't need to worry about any transactions. And then WAN posted this on Piazza, and I'll just emphasize this again. Grade scope is not meant to be for debugging, right? We if you submit it and it takes a half an hour before it starts running, we can't fix that. Right, that's up to grade scope, and there's a queue of other students with 100, you know, 100 students in the class. It's not going to run right away. So we provide some basic tests as a framework to figure out how to write more tests. But you should be doing as much as you know, all the development you want to figure out what your problem should be done locally. And then if you find your thing timing out because it's running too slow, you should figure out why your system is running slow locally. Don't make a bunch of you know minor changes and keep submitting them to grade scope and try to measure how long grade scope takes. You can figure these things out locally. So we already covered this. Don't change any file other than ones we give you. You want to rebase over the bus top master. There's instruction on Piazza how to do this. And then come to office hours if you have questions. I always have to say this. Don't plagiarize. We will destroy you. right? Because what will happen is if you do plagiarize or do copy from other people, the university comes back to me and say, hey, did you tell your students not to plagiarize? And I show them the video. And like, yes, here's me telling you not to plagiarize. Don't plagiarize. And that's evidence against you. You're screwed. OK? All right, next class. Uh, again, I will be gone. Uh, yes, it'll be gone. It's not be good. All right. Um, we'll be covering two days locking, and that's, that'll build upon what we talked about today. Okay? All right, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Oh, dear, coming through with my shell and poo. Two cents for a case, give me St. Oz poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up cans, met the cows in the jam, oh, how dry I with St. Ives in my system, crack another, I'm blessed, let's go get the next one and get over, the object is to stay sober, lay on the sofa, better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the be champ, stressed out, could never be son, Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one, naturally blessed, yes, my rap is like a laser beam, the pawns in the bushes, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Ives, St. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives, sip it through those who don't realize, the drinking ain't only to be drunk, you can't drive, keep my people still alive, and if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.